Hey, tailgaters! Ross of the Pigskin Tales Podcast here. Feel that summer heat? It's not just the sun, it's the thrill of upcoming college football season, stoking the coals. So get ready for the season, dive into the history books with Homefield, the premium collegiate apparel brand from Indianapolis. Homefield crafts incredibly comfortable gear designed with iconic vintage nods over 150 colleges. A library of history right on your chest. Homefield is the Indiana Jones of collegiate apparel, uncovering hidden gems from school archives. Unique mascots, logos, and even unforgettable moments frozen in time. Visit homefieldapparel.com and shop the archives. Homefield Apparel, where comfort, nostalgia, and the spirit of college football history unite. Again, that's homefieldapparel.com. Another episode of the Professional Football Researchers Association podcast here on the Sports History Network comes your way in just a moment. And uh, really excited to tell you about this episode as uh, George will join me later on. John here with you, but we had the pleasure here to uh, be joined by Wayne Fonts, a former head football coach in the NFL for the Detroit Lions back in the uh, 80s and 90s, had a number of fantastic stories from his playing days actually because he played some ball back in the day at Michigan State was a high school star here in Ohio where George and I obviously record the podcast and then uh, also ended up playing a bit of professional ball as well and uh, really a great storyteller probably one of our favorites that we've had on the podcast so far one of those guys that just uh, every time he speaks you could just listen to his stories and kind of gain some new knowledge from it. So some really exciting stuff. Uh, Wayne Fonts coming your way now as uh, George and I spoke to him on the phone here on the PFRA podcast. Thanks for listening. Another episode of the PFRA podcast here, Professional Football Researchers Association, and uh, we've had a number of great episodes to this point, and really excited about this next opportunity that we have uh, George and I to talk to our next guest, a former head football coach in the NFL, uh, played the game himself uh, at a pretty high level at one point, and uh, all around just uh, another great story uh, surrounding professional football and football in general, and that's... uh, former Detroit Lions head coach Wayne Fonts, who's joining us. Coach Fonts, thanks for joining us on the podcast. Uh, John, listen, you forgot to say I I went to Canton McKinley now. you got to put that in there. (laughs) We were going to get to it, Coach. We were going to get to it. McKinley Bulldogs, don't forget that. (laughs) McKinley Bulldogs and uh, Michigan State as well. Duffy Doherty you played for in uh, the college ball ranks. Coach, you had uh, had quite a career in football. Take me – Take me back to a young Wayne Fonts growing up in Canton, Ohio, and, and the inspiration that you had to get into the game of football. What inspired you to get into the game, Coach? You know, I guess uh, it was my only way probably to uh, uh, succeed in life. Uh, uh, growing up, I used to play with all the older guys, two years older, my brother, et cetera. And, you know, John, I'm very serious. When I, went, when I left at McKinley, I never knew. Maybe it's because I grew up in a in an ethnic background, and I had no idea that uh, I was going to get a football scholarship. Even when I had we had the great years at Canton McKinley, uh, I was shocked when I got uh, mail that said we'd like to you know, have you come down, fly you down, love to have you come to the school. And I went wow, uh, but it never crossed my mind. And uh, uh, if it wasn't, uh, I guess Canton McKinley that uh, uh, I'd probably be working in a steel mill right now. <laughs> Mm, mm. Well, now, Coach, you know they they did they close Republic Steel? <laughs> did they close the Republic Steel? My dad yeah. just worked at the Republic Steel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, Republic Steel, uh, as far as I know, is is gone. A lot of the industry in Canton now <laughs> is uh, no longer there because they used to have uh, Ford and uh, Republic Steel. And uh, um, I know my dad worked for the uh, Burgers, but my uncles they all worked. Uh, well, my uncle worked for Republic Steel, and actually. 
I worked at Republic Steel for a summer, worked my way through college. Well, let me tell you that. I mean, remember my dad, uh, he forgot his lunch, I think, one day, and he said uh, to uh, his wife, my mother, uh, have Wayne bring me my lunch. So yeah, I had my shorts on. I was getting ready to go to the, uh, the park, Cook's Park, and play football, baseball, whatever it was, basketball. So I had my shorts on, and I go running down to Republic Steel. I go over this bridge down into the uh, place, and I said, uh, my dad here, and they said, oh, and they said, he's down there. And so I went down there, and he, he comes to get his lunch, and he says, come on, son, I want to show you this. And I went down, and they were, they were uh, pouring hot steel. They were making uh, uh, graphs or whatever they were making, and they were, they were burning the steel, and the steel was just red hot burning. And I saw it going into whatever they were doing, and my dad looked at me and says, you see this? Do you want to work here? I said, please, please let me have a good reading, good senior year, because I didn't want to work there. I'll tell you that right now. There were sparks flying everywhere. I was jumping out of the way. My <laughs> God almighty. Yeah, that's sort of the same experience I had. My dad worked in the factory his whole life, and he sort of said the same thing. He said, I don't want this for you. You don't want this. And uh, oh. working, that one, working that one summer was enough to tell me that, hey, I, I need to <laughs> get an education and do something else. But listen, when I left, my shoes were on fire. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, Jeez. I believe it. I believe it. Hey, uh, Coach, when you were at McKinley, you, you played for – because you were an all-around athlete at McKinley. You played football, obviously, which is uh, – you know, you made all Ohio. You guys were on two of the greatest teams in McKinley history in 55 and 56. And you played, obviously, for two legendary coaches, Wade Watts for football. And then I know you also played some basketball, and you played for Bup Rerick. What were right. those What were those and experiences I, and I played like? Baseball. With, with, I played baseball for Red Arback. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So there many, you go. Go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt. You know, I, no. I, I rattle. You know, the older I get, I rattle a lot. I'm so I, I'm, I'm, so. Anyway, what were you going to ask me? I'm sorry. What, what were those experiences like? Because I know they were old school type of coaches. What were those experiences like? You know, they were great. Uh, if I would say that that maybe any other coaches, I don't know. I was very fortunate in high school to play for three great coaches. Uh, they were the type of coaches that made you want to succeed. They wanted you to play as best you could. Uh, Wade Watts. Uh, I think Wade Watts was a little bit ahead of his time in in uh, in high school football because I remember he put in the. I think we ran the option, and and nobody ran that option, and we ran it because we had Ike Grimsley uh, was our quarterback, and, and he he ran it. He knew how to run the option. I remember the first game of the season, my senior year. Uh, I called a uh, option play, and he was supposed to keep it. But as he got it, he faked inside it. Everybody went from him, so he had to pitch it to me. And I went 80 yards or whatever for a touchdown. And I said, well, this is easy. <laughs> you know what I mean? But uh, we had a good football team. Uh, we had uh, Ike Grimsey, who was uh, just a great, great college, uh, high school football, uh, quarterback. Uh, our entire team was good. If I had any, any success at all in football, I owed it to all those guys. They, they were great guys to play with. Uh, we we were all we cared about winning and we went on and won. We we were very good. I don't think there have been a, would have been a team in the whole United States of America would have beat us. I, I I was just looking back the other day and I think we we averaged maybe sixty six points a game. Yeah, I think you yeah. outscored your. I, I I can't remember. I I actually have the book here, and um, I think in uh, let's see in fifty in fifty six. You guys were basically beating people 80 to nothing or 80 to 6, 60 to 12, 61 to nothing, 66 to 13. You beat a good Maslin team 34 to 7, which was unheard of back then. You scored 490 points in 10 games. 400. Can you hear that horn going off? Yeah, that's okay. I think someone is trying to steal somebody's car. But anyway, <laughs> but anyway, yeah, we scored. I mean, uh, I don't know. Like I said, uh, John, I don't know if there's another football team that can say that they scored as many points as we did. But the big thing, Coach, is what that we didn't give up a lot of points. Uh, we we were good. Like I said, we had a, we had a 30, 40, 50 guys, whatever, and, and every one of those guys probably could have played somewhere else. Coach, and then, tell me. Of course, sorry. Go ahead. 
No, no, no. Go ahead, Coach. What were you going to say? No, go ahead. I was going to say that uh, I went from there to play basketball with Buck Rear. You know, I, I, I think about that a lot. You know, when I, I came from Massachusetts and uh, a small school, so uh, the guys weren't that big or whatever. And I remember going out for the basketball team as soon as football season ended. And uh, I, I was probably in, back in, in uh, Massachusetts, I was one of the tallest guys. But when I got to Camp McKinley basketball, I was the shortest guy. And I remember Buck Rick said, you're going to be a guard. And I said, sure, I could be a guard. And I could drive the ball. I could jump shoot. I could do all that stuff. But he, 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 he taught me how to shoot two-handed. So I guess when he was playing ball, they shot two-handed. So I never shot two-handed before in my life. I was scoring when I left that small school in Massachusetts, Coach. I was scoring like 20 points, 25, 30 points. And then I think when the basketball season ended, I averaged maybe three points a game. <laughs> but uh, we had – uh, as you, we had a great bunch of guys. I mean, I could go on and on. And uh, we went to the final game uh, and lost to Middletown, Ohio, I believe. So we had a great, great basketball team. And uh, Buck was awesome. He was just awesome. Coach, tell me about, uh, obviously, after you, you play at McKinley and you have all the success there, you go on to play at, at Michigan State, Duffy Doherty. You're, you're part of, you know, the Big Ten. You're part of... Division One college football. Tell me about that experience, what you learned under head coach Doherty, and, and just how that continued to kind of shape your life in football. Well, when I graduated from Canton McKinley, uh, I had a chance to go to many colleges, and Ohio State was one of them. And I remember Ike and I visited uh, uh, Ohio State, and then we went and visited Michigan State, and said, et cetera, et cetera. Everybody thought I was going to go to Ohio State. I had two brothers that went to Ohio State, and my older brother went there, and he said, uh, Wayne, I'm here at Ohio State. Go where you think you're going to enjoy the next four years of your life. And when I met Duffy Doherty, uh, he was great. The whole staff was outstanding, and the players that they were brought in my senior year there were all super guys, and, and I chose to go to Michigan State, and I think it was the right thing for me. Uh, Duffy was, uh, you know, I did a, a lot of things. Duffy was funny. He he was, he would walk on the practice field with a whistle and he would just whistle it and put it around his, his neck and just whistle it back and forth. And, uh, Woody Hayes was very serious, but, uh, I chose Michigan state. Uh, I think I had a nice career there. Uh, I, you know what coach, I liked it. I had the best four, maybe, no, I went five years. I had the best five years of my life at Michigan State was just just awesome well and and you know you mentioned the the kind of comedy I guess you say the the funny things that the coach Doherty was like but I mean y- you have a sense of humor yourself I mean obviously we're just talking to you on the phone but I mean I can tell you've got a sense of humor you're, you're quick-witted did he kind of did he kind of shape the coach that you became coach yeah you know what <clears throat> excuse me he he taught me uh, I guess how to relate with other people and other players. He taught me. In fact, when uh, when I first got there, I, I I won the oil can award. That was the, for the player that was uh, that helped the team. That was for the funniest player on the team that played and made a difference in a football game. I remember winning that award, and I said, uh, "How about give me a little more than an oil can? Please, at least put some oil in it or something." But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyway, guys were getting watches and trophies, and I got an oil can. But but Duffy was he was great, and uh, you know what? He was great. He was great to me, and, and uh, I respected that. And I remember when I was my friend. Am I rattling too much here? No, 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 no. no, no keep going. Okay, when I my uh, I was a freshman at Michigan State, and that's when the freshmen we weren't allowed to play in on the varsity. But we were allowed to practice. We practiced right beside the varsity. And I had, I had a pretty good freshman year in, in football. And so we were practicing one day, and the manager came over and said uh, to our freshman coach, he said, Duffy wants to see Wayne Fonts over on the varsity field. So uh, I said, oh, my God. And all the players went, Wayne, Wayne, Wayne. And I said, yes. <laughs> yes. I'm from Canton McKinley. I could do this. So I went to the other side of the canvas. And all the varsity players were there, and they saw me coming in, this young hot dog type guy. So I got in the huddle. And, John, to this day, to this day, I believe 
They set me up. I really do. When I got in the huddle, Duffy said, get in the huddle with the, the offensive team. I got in the huddle, and he called like 24, 25 belly, whatever it was. And, and it was just, give me the ball. I was going to go left and cut back. But when we broke the huddle, it had to be that all the, our offensive linemen must have said, he's going to the left. Because as soon as I touched it, the ball went flying in the air. My, when I got off the ground, my helmet, I was looking under my ear hole. I, I kind of, my ankle was, was uh, not busted. It, uh, I tore my Achilles tendon all in one play. I said, what a career I've got as a running back here. But I tell you, to this day, John, I think they told the guys where I was going. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> that's a great story, Coach. Yeah, well, that's, it's true. So when I came out of the, the, uh, that side of the field and I came out in a stretcher, and all the players are going, Wayne, Wayne, Wayne. <laughs> Thank God. Oh, go ahead. God. Go ahead, George. Hey, Coach. Yeah, Coach, this is George. Hey, after you left Michigan State, you then went on and you played for a season with the New York Titans yes. of the old AFL. And you, you played for Bulldog Turner. And from everything I read, uh, that was a wild experience. What was And, and you, you distinguish yourself. I, I know you got hurt, but – you played about nine games and had four interceptions. Actually, you set a record for an interception return. And that record held for about 30 years, too. Uh, and, you know, after the – I had an opportunity to go to uh, to New York, uh, Philadelphia, and to Toronto, Oregon, in Canada. And I chose the, the Jets. I mean, it became the Jets the following year uh, because I said, let me go to, uh, to New York, and, and I'm going to set a standard in New York. And then I got hurt, of course, and I was heading to the Pro Bowl. I'm saying that right now to you guys. But anyway, I remember getting hurt, and then a year or two later, I remember Joe Namus did a uh, 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 interview, and they they told Joe that I had this, done this, that I had met Joe Namus before, and they, they said, uh, Joe, tell us how it was. My players, when I was coaching in Detroit, they said, uh, Joe, tell us about our coach, Wayne, that – did he really go 83 yards for a touchdown? Was he any good? He said, I'll tell you this. Wayne was running. When he intercepted the ball, he said he was running down the sideline so slow the defense ran by him. So he went 83 yards for a touchdown. <laughs> <laughs> so, listen. So, I mean, so I'm, I'm, I'm there talking to the players. And I said, I'll tell you something. I said, you know the reason why Joe Namely wanted me out? He said the town wasn't big enough for both of us. <laughs> <laughs> they, you know, they might have called me Broadway Wayne. Who knows? <laughs> coach, coach, this is this is John again here, and, and you know, I, I I think I think it's 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 so fascinating. You know, all the levels of of football you got to play in and and be a part of, and and you know, I mean, you get that that one year that you play at a really high level in in the pro game. And obviously you get injured, but do you think that the injury doesn't happen? What do you think that would have done to change your career? I'm losing you. I, I was saying, I was saying you, you get that one year coach where you play pro um, and then you get injured. Do you think that you would have still coached if you hadn't gotten injured? Do you think you would have kept going on as a coach? Or do you think that that, that injury shaped you to wanting to become a coach? George, I feel so good right now. And if I didn't get hurt, I might still be playing. <laughs> uh, I, I still be, and I'm my, a, a, over 80. Uh, you, know, you know what? I think it did shape my uh, my career. I had a chance to go and play uh, for the Detroit Tigers in baseball, the Cleveland Indians in baseball. Uh, but I chose to play football, and, and, and I got hurt. You know, uh, I, I'm doing the, with the, whatever cards I've been dealt, and I'm playing them. And I did get hurt, but I tell you, you talked about Bulldog Turner. I, I remember him as the head coach. I coached for, I played for John McVeigh at the University of Dayton, and he was the first uh, college coach I worked with, and just an unbelievable personality, a great, great, great man. And he taught me many things. Then I left uh, uh, Dayton and then went to uh, uh, back to Michigan State to get my master's which I do have a master's. I want you to know that. I do have a master's degree. And uh, and then I, I coached with Michigan State uh, while I was getting a my master's degree. And I learned a lot from Duffy. Uh, and his way, uh, uh, George, was that he, he, he had a good time with the players. 
the players liked Duffy. Uh, I'm not saying he, he was too soft, but he got along with all his players, and I liked him a lot. So as I got older, uh, I remember a lot of things I'd learned from Duffy Darty. But when I left Michigan State, <clears throat> excuse me, I graduated, and uh, then I went to Dayton, and I, I got John McVay, like I said, and I learned a lot of things from a lot of different coaches. And then when I went to Southern Cal, uh, the, my last stop as a head coach in college, uh, I worked for John, Mc, uh, John McKay, and uh, I learned maybe uh, a little more discipline. He, he was a, a one-line guy. He made everybody laugh. But he was a very, very tight, uptight up person. Uh, if you messed up, you were going to hear about it. And uh, some of the players and people around John McVay really didn't like him because he was – uh, he wasn't acoustic. He was just, uh, he had one liner that either you laughed or you, didn't, you thought he was a pain in the ass. But uh, I learned a lot from him. I remember uh, one game, uh, we, were, we had just gone to the Rose Bowl and, and we were out having a good time. And he said, uh, uh, what are you doing? I, I said, eh, nothing. He said, drive me home. And, uh, and I said, okay. And all, of, all the other coaches were at this table. And he said, Wayne, well, drive me home. And everybody looked up and said, what's that all about? So uh, he gets behind the wheel and, and he's driving and he looks at me and says, uh, he's very quiet. And he says, uh, Wayne, what are your aspirations in life? And uh, I said, you know what, coach? I hope someday I will be as good as you. And he looked at me, he said, great answer. He said, because we are going to coach the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in the NFL. I looked at him and, and I thought the guy was crazy. I said, where is Tampa? I, I didn't know where I was going. And he didn't give me an opportunity to say no. Because as we was driving there, he said, at this time, your wife's at my house with my wife, and they're looking at houses. So uh, we pulled up at his house, and uh, uh, I ended up going to Tampa Bay, and, and, and the rest is history now. I mean, it's uh, I've, I've been very lucky. Uh, I, I talked to Ronnie Blackledge, Ike Grimsley, uh, from, from Canton a lot. Uh, I know, I know that I hope they're listening and they told me to mention their name. So I did. <laughs> Go ahead, George. When you, uh, you were at Tampa Bay for a number of years, uh, and then you finally moved on, uh, after a number of years there, you, uh, you were obviously assistant coach and you were defensive coordinator, and then you ended up going to Detroit and then you were defensive coordinator for a couple of years there. And then you finally got your opportunity to be head coach. Uh, with the Lions. Uh, how did that feel at that time as you were been working your way up, you know, with uh, these number of coaches, getting this training and everything like that? Was that something that you were aspiring to at that time? Uh, yes. I, I, I wanted, you know, uh, John, when I was coaching at the Bucks, uh, I had opportunities to go back and, and uh, uh, be head coach at uh, Southern California uh, College. They called me and wanted to know if I want any for the job. And John McKay said, uh, no, you don't want to do that. You're going to get this job here at Tampa Bay. So I said, no, I don't want it. Then I got a call from Michigan State, Arizona State. So I had a lot of chances to move from Tampa to a head coaching job in college. And they were all all excellent colleges. John John McKay, they, they almost promised me the job. If I stayed here at Tampa Bay, they almost promised me the head job. So I stayed. I thought I was going to get that job. When I didn't get it, I mean, I was a broken man. I, I, uh, it was, it was hard. Uh, I had tears in my eyes. I, they, I had, of course, I had to do an interview with the press. I couldn't even finish it because I, the job is going to be mine. But the owner came to me and says, "Don't worry about it. Uh, we've already talked to a new head coach coming in. You will be a uh, defensive coordinator, assistant head coach." And they said, "And, and yeah, you will get a nice raise, the whole deal." And, and so when the head coach came in, he said, "Well." We all set to go, Wayne. I said, listen, I know deep in your heart, you can't want me here. I said, uh, I wanted this job, and these players wanted me to have this job. So I would be a deterrent to be here. So I would appreciate it if you put my name on the waiver wire, let other teams know that I am available. And uh, never forget the head coach looked at me and said, Coach, I really appreciate it. He said, because it would have been, it have been difficult. Because you know what? He's the head coach, and the players wanted me to be the guy. So uh, I didn't get it. I went on to Detroit, and uh, 
I guess uh, I coached there as an assistant uh, three years, uh, two year and a half years or whatever, and uh, I ended up getting a head job. Coach, tell me, um, you know, you, you were lucky to, to obviously coach a lot of great players in the time that, that you coached as an assistant and then eventually as a head coach. But um, there's a lot of people that would say that, that you coach the greatest running back of all time. Uh, I know that, that people could dispute that, but um, tell me about coaching Barry Sanders and just being on the sideline when he's doing his thing, when, when you know, you know a play is called and, and you know he's going to get the ball. Just take, take me through watching Barry carry the football. Uh, Barry Sanders, uh, John, <clears throat> he was second to none. They talk about Jim Brown, uh, uh, Emmett Smith, uh, uh, O.J. Simpson. I mean, you could talk about all these great running backs. Barry was in a class uh, by himself. Uh, one of the greatest. He was a better person, number one, than he was a player. This, was a, this guy was a, a class guy all the way. Uh, when, we, when we went to work him out, when it was his junior year, he was coming out to play. And I remember I went to watch him work out. And I had cigars in my pocket, and all the other coaches were there from their other other teams, and they said we want to trade. We'll take, uh, give you our, we'll give you two player, two players, a draft choice, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, so we could draft Barry Sanders. And after I saw his workout, I went, I, I lit up the cigar and said, "Guys, go home." I said, "I'm taking Barry Sanders," and everybody went crazy because the first pick was already taken, John. First pick. Uh, the Dallas Cowboys took uh, Aikman. And the second pick, the Green Bay Packers said they wanted Mandridge. So we picked third, so I knew I was going to take Barry Sanders. A lot of people thought we were going to take Deion Sanders, which would have been bad either. But we took Barry and to you, your dad, and everybody that knows football, this was the best running back you could ever see, and this was the best person that you could be uh, associated with. He reminded me when I coached with the Bucks of Leroy Selman. Uh, and then uh, when I was in the, uh, Detroit, I got Chris Spielman. Uh, I mean, I, I was very fortunate to be around great players and great people. Chris Spielman fired the team up like he can be. Whatever Chris Spielman did, the players went crazy. And Barry would just lay on the floor with a towel over his head, waiting for the players to come on. We're going to go out in 10 minutes. Let's go, Barry. And I'd go over and I take the towel off his head and say, Barry, you ready? He said, I'm ready to go, coach. And he would get up, and out we went. Uh, and, but Chris, Chris, you guys, you guys do remember Chris Spielman. Absolutely. Oh, of course. Of course. Okay. Chris Spielman, when we got dressed up for the game, and, and I would talk to all my players, and I said, where's Chris? He'd be in the shower walking back and forth, back and forth. <laughs> I said, he's ready. I said, he's ready. You know, yeah, you know, let, me tell you, let me tell you what. Uh Wayne Fonts, I, I am, uh, I'm very lucky. Uh, and uh, people say, no, you worked for it. Yes, they did. But uh, I was very fortunate when I got the job, all my jobs, that I was surrounded by good people. I was surrounded by guys that cared. And when I got the head job at the Lions, I told the players this. I walked in the meeting room and I said, I'm going to make this the best job you've ever had. You're going to walk in this building and be proud to be a part of the Detroit Lions. And, and that's how I started. Uh, I guess they said I was a player's coach, but I learned that from lots and lots of other coaches. You know, like, what, was it, what was it like working for the, what was it like working for the Ford family? You know what? People said they, they uh, were just, they were disappointed in Mr. Ford. Like he didn't want to win. That's BS. Mr. Ford was great. He was outstanding. He wanted to win. And I'm going to say this right now, and, and don't, they don't think it's sour grapes. We came close in in uh, 91. We came close. We went to four or five playoffs in a row. Uh, the thing that we lacked was quarterback. We never had the top quarterback, and this is not sour grapes. I had good quarterbacks, but I didn't have uh, Steve Young, Joe Montana. Uh, uh, well, I mean, uh, I mean, I didn't have that quality of a quarterback and I and I told people I never said it publicly way back then because I, I would never say that but the players knew we lacked that player and you know what if you look in the press back then when they were always on my hind end 
uh, you can't win, you can't do this, you can't do that. And I never said I didn't have a good quarterback. And if you look at the first player taken in the NFL draft, who is it? Quarterback. 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 Yeah. And if you don't, listen to me. And I always said this. You could lose with one, but you can't win without one. In other words, mm -hmm. you could lose with a great quarterback, mm -hmm. but you're not going to win the Super Bowl without it. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and it's interesting because today's game, and, and I don't know how much you still keep up with the game, Coach, but I mean, like... They, I'm losing I'm losing a little bit. Sorry, sorry, Coach. What I was saying right. is that I, I don't know how much you keep up with today's game still, but, but um, you know, I mean, you mentioned about a quarterback, and, and the game has changed so much. When when you were coaching, I mean, running the football was still kind of the, the thing to do, and I feel like it's changed so much now. What what would you feel about coaching in today's NFL? Would do you think you'd enjoy it or do you think you'd dislike it? Oh, I think I would love it, but uh, the game has changed so much and it's all about money now. Uh, it's all about players going from one team to another, and I could understand that, pay them what they're worth. It's a very, very vicious game. Uh, but uh, it's, it's, it's one of those things where if you sat down in, in, your, in your chair when you go home and you say, you know what, maybe I could get another job at another station. Would it be better? Are you going because the station's better? Or are you leaving there for money? And what I'm trying to say, Coach, is it became a money game. Uh, and it became, when I coached, it was a running game, defensive game. And people keep seeing uh, on the announcers say, uh, you win Super Bowls by running the football. You know what? You win by throwing the ball. You win by throwing the ball. And then when you head, then you run the ball and kill the clock. But you have to be able to throw the ball to win and you better have a quarterback now that can move. Because I'll tell you this, quarterbacks that just drop back, they can't make it anymore. The defensive linemen are too good. Wow. Wow. Well, and, and you and you coached at a time too, Coach, when, you know, I mean, some of those defensive linemen, I mean, you went against you went against guys like, like Lawrence Taylor and you went against guys like Reggie White. I mean, you, you had to deal with some big dudes yourself. I mean, but – but running the football kind of kind of makes going against those guys a little bit easier, doesn't it? Oh yeah, well, yeah, absolutely. Right now, because I mean, right now you you're looking to draft a defensive end that rushes the passer, and you get and all your linemen now because of the statistic of how many sacks did you have. The more sacks you have, the more money you make. So it became a game where rush the quarterback. So that's why teams that run the ball well they 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 usually win or they usually control the clock. Hmm. George, go ahead. Coach, you uh, you you stayed with the Lions, and then uh, obviously you you retired after that. Did you ever have any desire after you left the Lions to get back in the game? Uh, seriously, maybe 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 uh, no no. I remember I remember when I walked out of the stadium when uh, and Mr. Ford they fired me. I walked out and did a press conference, and I said. Uh, this will be the last time you see my smiling face on the sideline. And, uh, and it was, uh, the first, the first month or so I couldn't, uh, I couldn't sleep because, you know, you get up early every day, you get up early every day, you're at the office. But as soon as I managed my time, like if I woke up at six o'clock, <laughs> I would turn the TV on and watch an old cowboy movie. I'd watch a John Wayne movie, and and I and then I if I fell asleep, I went back to sleep. So uh, so did I miss it? Yes, I missed it. But would I go back? No. Uh, my wife didn't want me to go back, and I married a girl from Timken. Uh, my wife didn't want me to go back, and my children, they didn't want me to go back. They they put pictures on my eighth year as head coach on the refrigerator, and and my wife said take a look at this one. Now take a look at this one. She said, take a look in the mirror. Take a look at your face now. And uh, I, I got it old. I got old and, and I couldn't believe it. I felt too much pressure, whatever it was. And right now I look younger than I did in 1956. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, I, have to ask you one, I have to ask you one other question because this is sort of full circle because we started the interview talking to you about Canton McKinley. You, you obviously coach Chris Spielman, who was from Maslin. McKinley's Huge rival for our listeners that don't know that. And then you also were very good friends with John McVeigh, who was also uh, Mass a massive yeah, he, product. Did, did you guys ever, you know, 
yank each other's chain about, you know, you're McKinley, they're Maslin? Or oh, absolutely. That... absolutely. I would, I'd be in a locker room and I'd tell these guys, don't even mention Central Catholic. Don't even mention <laughs> Maslin. He said, just go back to the record book and check it out. I said, we were, <laughs> we were awesome. You know, when we drafted, uh, I said, uh, I think we're at the top of the second round, whatever, and I saw Chris Spill, the name was still on the board. And I was surprised they didn't go in the, in the first round. But And I said, well, how come Chris Spillman, we're going to pick again. How come Chris Spillman uh, is still up there? They said, well, uh, the scouts say he's uh, not tall enough. They say he's not fast enough. I said, let me tell you something. <laughs> I've seen this guy in every film. He is a giant. He's fast enough, and he will kick your butt. I said, if he's there, when they predict this round, take him. And all Chris Billman ever did when I walked in Ohio State, all he did was make tackles. And when he came to the NFL, he did the same thing. And uh, he, he was kind of one of our leaders in our team. Uh, I can't tell you enough about Chris. Chris was a great person and an excellent football player. Coach, do you think Chris Spielman deserves uh, consideration for the Hall of Fame? Well, absolutely. Not only because he, uh, of his skill as a player, but uh, he deserves uh, that recognition because the person he was. Uh, you can't listen to me. You can't find, uh, in my opinion, a better person uh, than than Chris Billman was. I um, had I had Barry Sanders. He's in a Barry Sanders class. Leroy Selman's class. He's in a class with great people. Last thing I want to ask you, Coach. Please, I mean, I got a, I got a, I got a full house sitting there. <laughs> Is this? You know, you 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 coached at at all these different levels. You were part of all these different great games, and, and I've heard people say this, and I want to ask you the thing, too, because you you really did get to the mountaintop being in the NFL. And um, Did anything ever compare to McKinley-Maslin for you? Did anything as a rivalry game, as the intensity, did anything ever compare to that for you from the standpoint of the competitive fire that brought you in again? Those that don't know that are listening, that's the, the big rivalry that, that Coach Fonz played in, in high school, but – did did anything you ever see or saw compare to that at the higher level? Uh, at the higher level, I, re- I remember but going back to Masson McKinley and Masson game, McKinley game. Uh, our first game of the season, uh, we were con- Wade Watts after beat. We won our first game, eighty to nothing, whatever. Wade, Wade Watts was talking about Masson. He he knew what kind of football team he had. He knew there was nobody. On our on our schedule, they could come close to us, and, and I was I was in awe. He felt that way, and uh, and then when we beat Maslin, I said, "Wow!" I mean, I mean, to, to go ahead and beat Maslin, it was a thirty thirty four to seven, yeah, mm-hmm. thirty four to seven. And I remember that game. Uh, our our left running right running back uh, was his name Phil 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 Phil. Come to me. He Phil he ran. Yeah, uh, he had he made. Two great runs. I mean, I think he went like 50 yards for one and 65 for another. And uh, I mean, he broke he broke their backs. And I remember getting in the huddle some in on a lot of downs when he played third down, like third and three. I would get in the huddle and he'd say, "Okay, okay, Wayne, this is this is you make those three yards for us." And he would turn around, give me the ball, and I go straight ahead and make four. And I'd come back and he would give it to Phil. You know. What I mean? But anyway, that that game was hard to rival because. Everybody expected those two teams to be the best in that year. So uh, uh, I can't, I can't, I can sit here and talk, tell you stories forever. Uh, but I have to go back to my card game and, and win some money here. But uh, I appreciate the call. I have so many great memories uh, of, of Canton, Ohio, and Canton McKinley, uh, Michigan State, pro football. Uh, uh, I just say Wayne Fonts was lucky. And, and, uh, and I was surrounded by great people. And uh, whatever I did, I told the players when I left, you guys have made, even my high school, my play, high school coaching players, they, they would come in, they would call me. And I thank every player, every player at a high school level, college level, pro level, I thanked each one of them for help making Wayne Font what I am today. Coach, we appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us. Hey, thank you, guys. We appreciate you guys. Love you guys. Take care. Yep, you too. Hey there, Sports History fan. Hope you enjoyed another nostalgic episode here on the Sports History Network. By now, 
you've heard us rave about two books, The Golf Round I'll Never Forget and NBA 75, The Definitive History. Have you snagged your copies yet? If so, well, we applaud you for great taste. But if you haven't, well, listen up. Because our generous partners over at Firefly Books are giving away a free copy of each book to one of our dedicated fans. To enter the giveaway for your chance at winning one of these awesome books, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash giveaways. Again, that's sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash giveaways. Good luck, and remember, you can come back daily to earn more entries.